when you start small and you listen from people pain points from coming from a platform being shut down or you building one feature that you know is solving a core problem for your community or, or certain individuals when you start listening and say hey they want this and you start acting on it fast like i know five people want this may not be a hundred but five people want this feature those may be the five who, who spoke up but maybe a hundred wanted it and you listen you start building on it and keep reiterating that process and listen with empathy community building is not that hard after that welcome everyone i'm your host Ivana Istochka, and this is the Community Revolution Podcast. This show is a series of conversations with community experts, creators, and tech leaders building exceptional communities. It is proven that communities make our lives better, and I believe that building them is more important than ever. The goal of this show is to bring to light the power of communities, amplify the voices of the incredible people building them, and extract actionable advice to help anyone build their own. This show is brought to you by Amity a global scale-up powering the social networks and communities of tomorrow. Today, my guest is Wayne Sutton. Wayne is a serial entrepreneur, advisor, a leading voice in diversity and inclusion, avid motorcycle rider, and a community pro. Among others, he is the founder of the Icon Project, addressing mental health and professional development needs for black and brown men in tech, a co-founder of Change Catalyst, program building inclusive tech ecosystems, and the community leader at Observable, a collaborative data platform. In our conversation, he shares how communities evolved over the years, insights into how Observable empowers data visualization creators to collaborate, why building communities with empathy is a key, mental health, and the importance of acting on our passions. I loved doing this interview, and I'm super excited for you to learn from Wayne. With that, I bring you Wayne Sutton. Hi, Wayne. Good morning. Welcome to the Community Revolution Podcast. Hi, Ivana. Thanks for having me. Very nice to chat to you today. So to start with, I was hoping to ask you, what does community mean to you? Oh, wow. That's a deep question these days. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Community means to me um, a sense of togetherness, a sense of not being alone, a sense of feeling safe. You know, we think about family when we hear the word community. But we'll also take them out in terms of communication, dialogue. It's not a one way. It's, a, it's multiple people sharing and giving and helping and supporting one another. And Wayne, you have such a fascinating and diverse background. I was hoping that uh, for the people that don't know you, you can share a little bit about who you are. My current role is I'm community lead at a company called Observable. It's a destination for creators to build data, data visualizations. Prior to Observable, I spent around eight years working on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in tech. Co-founded a company called Change Callus with um, my, my wife and um, Melinda Brianna Epler. And we launched a conference called Tech Inclusion. We went across the world, focused on entrepreneurship, venture capital, uh, culture, workplace culture, hiring, uh, so what stories being told uh, around creating diversity and inclusive um, ecosystems. Uh, we did start doing consulting, worked with numerous tech companies in Silicon Valley, in the Bay Area. Also, during that time frame, I saw the need to um, create a community for Black and Brown men in tech to focus on professional development, wellness, and mental health. And I, and I started a nonprofit called the Icon Project. We did virtual summits. Uh, we did in person summit before the pandemic. We had a nonprofit fund uh, that focused on people who need therapy or mental health services and may not be able to afford it. Um, people can apply for that and have a Slack community with over a thousand black and brown men in tech um, uh, to support one another. Prior to Change Callus, I was some nerd geek entrepreneur. I uh, was one of the co founders of the very first incubator accelerator in 2011 that was focused on underrepresented founders. Uh, that was really before the public and people were, I say loud, but people were, were you know, willing to talk about diversity, inclusion, or lack thereof in tech back in 2011, 12. That's when the tech industry was still prodding itself of the meritocracy, which we know was not true. And pattern matching, what still exists today, was the was the theme of success. And uh, I quickly learned in 2011 and 2012 that the tech industry was not ready to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, or lack thereof in tech. So, did my share of 
creating hackathons, partnering with friends, joining a startup, raise an angel, lose an angel, um, that whole nine um, in Silicon Valley between 2012 and 2014. Like I said, I'm a nerd, I'm a geek, and love tech and love bringing people together. What I really love about your history is that you've done so many different things. And everything is centered around diversity, inclusion, empowering people, and uh, building empowering technologies. So I really look forward to having this conversation with you. Around communities. So you've, as you said, you've done a lot of different things, and you've been in the space of communities in different ways and forms for about 15 years. So I would love to understand, how do you see the space of community, and how have you seen communities evolve and change throughout these past 15 years? Wow. Um, it's interesting because a lot of activities around communities have stayed the same. The platforms have evolved and we as humans have evolved in the past 15 years, right? We think about communities early on, online. It was communities around forms, right? We think about Reddit early on, form like platform has, has evolved. You find a common interest, what is your TV show? video game, technology, trying to learn the code. There was always forums or something, uh, 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 a listserv. People were building communities there. Like I said, I've been around, my, around the block for a while. I remember when it was not okay to meet in person or people were afraid to meet in person. You can have this big community, thousands of people caring about technology or a certain topic. And it was, oh, we're going to meet in person. Should we meet people on the internet in person? That was a thing back in the day, right? And <laughs> um, and then it evolved to you think about you know, the um, you know, people, the, the team that started bar camps back in the day, or and then we started doing ignite talks, and then we had the South by Southwest continue to grow as a conference, you know, TED talks, and the world started merging. So then we start really seeing the emergence of online and offline communities d- developing, and so the online, the offline um, relationships will start impacting and growing the online communities. And the online communities started involving and impacting the offline relationships. And then different communities were spin out. Then we started seeing the rise of social media with Twitter. And I used to host a lot of tweet ups like in North Carolina back in the day. This is 2008, 2009, 2010 time frame. And it was a thing because like, oh, I'm going to meet people who I follow on Twitter. Is that okay? But a lot of relationships built and community building came out of that. And so if you get to today, a lot of stuff is still the same around the, the outcomes of community, right? The relationship building, you support one another, help people find jobs, helping people learn learn new skills, help people not feel alone, common interests, whether it's you know a certain program language or it's helping them learn a new skill or just hobbies. The tools and technologies evolve is better, right? We have you no, know, we we can we can record a podcast and join the Slack community around around everything you do, right? There's the community revolution that can, you could build a whole have a whole just score server and people can chat. Score server form back in the days, same thing. And form still exists. Things move much faster now than it did, you know, 15 years ago. People now make careers out of teaching other people how to build community, right? Um, there's more there's more opportunities in community building. You can be an analyst and write a whole book about community building or create a blog or a newsletter around community building where before that wasn't, you know, it wasn't a thing, right? You had maybe had one or two people who start talk about it, but now anyone can jump in and say, you know what, I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn, I'm going to start a podcast, start a book, start a new, write a book, write and do a newsletter around community building. So a lot of things move faster these days and people learn faster. Today, we're in an interesting time where we look at people spinning up Mastodon servers and just clear guidelines. All right, these are the rules, right? Which is the outcome of what we see happen on Twitter and some other platforms, and where people want to be a part of communities where they feel safe and where there's a clear guideline connected to their values. A lot of that should have happened 15 years ago, but it did. 100%. I think it also comes by the fact that we are more connected than ever. And I think being so connected, it also comes with consequences by us continuously talking with different people, continuously being bombarded by facts and conversations. And we are becoming, of course, more sensitive to the people that we're interacting, to what we are hearing, and so on and so forth. You know, I was uh, 
researching something, some health problem that I have. And the first thought on my mind was, I need to find a community for this. There must be other people that are going through the same struggle as me. And yesterday I spent so much time going through all these different communities. And I was just, uh, you know, trying to find what are the communities that are similar to me in values. And I was actually looking at criteria, like which of these communities are moderated? Are there medical professionals inside? And in the past, of course, I would go online and check information, but I wouldn't go as detailed as I do today because the expectations is just there. I also work in communities, so maybe I'm a a bit more detailed (laughs) than others, but yeah. Yeah, interesting. Thank you for sharing. So how has your experience, let's say, of doing all these things led you to become a community lead at Observable and working as a community lead at a company? Yeah, yeah. At Observable, you know, we we, we won't be the destination for data uh, developers creating data visualizations. And I have built websites. I, I dabbled a little bit in JavaScript. I built some platforms in there. I get it. I understand it. But in a day when you're doing community building, whether it's with people around entrepreneurships, where you look at community building around diversity, equity, inclusion, you look at community building around social media, you're still doing with humans, right? And when I saw the opportunity uh, around Azorgo come up, it presented me with a, um, an opportunity and a challenge. And I like challenges. And and uh, it also presented me an opportunity to grow. And but observable, it's, in a, it's, it's, it's a cool platform, right? It's not a social media platform, but there's potential opportunity for it to have social media features where you know, a user, can, uh, someone from the, someone individual can create an account, can start building um, a data visualization, can create numerous notebooks in the public uh, or private if they subscribe. And companies can create uh, different teams on a the platform. Uh, they can collaborate privately or publicly if they choose. Uh, we have a forum. We have a Slack community. So you look at look at all these elements. It's community, like it's community building. And we have an explore page that show the most recent data visualization that's been built. We have um, show trending topics. What does that sound like? It kind of sound like Twitter, right? There's other features and platforms. You know, we, we we have coming down the road. We cur- you know, we have the like button on you know, notebooks. What does that sound like, right? So you look at my experience and where the platform has come from and where it's evolving to. Um, I, it, it aligns and. When I saw the, the, the possibilities, what you can do, not just create data visualizations, but the collaboration and an opportunity for, to, uh, for people to learn because you can create data visualizations. You can look at the code right below the data viz and be like, oh, I can see how that was built. And I can now learn. Let me, let me fork this notebook and, and try to learn and, and, and add my own data and try, to, and try to learn how this was built and maybe create something cool for, my, for myself or for my colleagues. And, and that type of culture and that type of creativity is something that intrigued me. That's amazing. And for people who are not familiar with Observable, can you please share what is Observable and who is part of your community? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, Observable is the destination for data visualization. It's a platform where individuals and teams can go, can, can create, uh, can collaborate to, to build data visualizations and, tell, uh, and get the insights from data, from the data, um, data, visualizations, that data visualization that they create on the platform. And who, are, who is our community? Our community is a mix of, of developers, decision makers, JavaScript. The platform is primarily focused on people who uh, um, code in JavaScript. And so um, uh, JavaScript developers, uh, but also decision makers and people looking to get insights from, from data. So that's primarily our community. So when in the previous answer, you mentioned that something that really drew you to Observable is that it's really community and collaboration centric. And uh, the mission of building communities is not always building another social network, as you mentioned. It is also helping people collaborate and connect over their passions. And in your case, that's data visualizations. So Observable has the largest library of data visualizations anywhere, if I'm not mistaken, and they're all provided by your community. And what is really fascinating is that not only people are sharing the data, their data, but they do it so that others can build on top of it. And often they collaborate with others to get a better understanding. So can you please talk a bit about how do you build a platform that is collaboration and community-centric? Building a platform that is collaborative and community-centric, um, I think about the one word, that's uh, empathy. And with that is you build it empathetic to the, the community needs, a lot of listening, a lot of, um, um, you know, it's, it sounds cliche, but listening, um, surveys, 
understanding the community needs. Uh, CEO and the youth success team, they do a lot of customer journey tours where, where they talk with customers, understand what the needs are, what's not in the platform that they would need to do their job better, right? Then you take that back to the team and developer community, the developers on the team and, and, and try to build it in. And then from my perspective, what the, for what the community is, is okay, how, you know, how do people, think about how people learn. People learn through examples. People learn through conversations. People learn through, through show and tell. So how you, how do you, how do I surface uh, members of the community who have create awesome data visualizations or either at different stages of their learning journey who are creating on the platform and share their stories. And then also we have an, uh, an ambassador program. So how do we leverage our ambassadors to be advocates out in the community, to evangelize about the product, to increase word of mouth, to bring in different people from all stages, from beginners to immediate to advanced uh, uh, developers that understand that, hey, this is, this is a platform that has a barrier of entry. You can do everything in the browser. You can collaborate. You can, you can you know, create dashboards. You can build some very, very detailed data visualizations. And uh, it's not that hard. And, uh, it, and how with the ambassadors and being the advocates and being out in the community um, and other communities that we, we need to reach, again, goes back to empathy. I really have a big respect and admiration for building with empathy because I see a lot of people building products and being very disconnected with the people that they're building the products for. So building with empathy really allows anyone to build products <laughs> that are meaningful and they can actually add value to people, which is at the end of the day, what, what we all should be doing. I actually met you, Wayne, at one of your meetups in San Francisco that happened right after the Observable Insights Community Conference, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, what I was really impressed by is that at that meetup, I also met some of your engineers and some of the people from your product team and I spoke to them and they spoke with so much passion about the product that they're building. And they shared with me stories of how they attended these conferences and they spoke to users. And for me, this was really fascinating because it was really a proof that you're not really building your community by having a community department and, you know, doing some initiative, but community is really part of everything you do and all the teams are involved in it. Um, and I find that very fascinating. Can you also please share how do you work together with all the different departments in Observable to build all of these initiatives and to build relationship with your users? Yeah, I would say that is an evolving process, right? We are a remote first company at Observable and uh, you know, we, we use Slack internally like many companies. But it's evolving, right? You know, you have a company that started right before the pandemic and then um, that was in part, that was had an office. We have an office now, like you mentioned, but it was oh, we, it was going to all be in person, and then it evolved to being remote. Remote, so it's a lot of sharing. You know, we do the we do the stand ups, just different projects that are uh, cross team projects. Uh, we have to over communicate, um, try to collaborate, collaborate as much as possible. Uh, collaboration is part of one of our values, so we need to be collaborative internally, right? So. Um, uh, for example, I think about the conference. That was a, a team effort. Myself and you know, the team, community team led led the charge. But you know, you know, being a developer for his platform, and everybody at the company is not a developer. So we need support. We need an engineering team to be there to help answer questions, provide um, any uh, technical support. We have a great um, design team that that really try to design with empathy in mind as well, and be creative and fun. And so uh, when we, we're looking for design resources, we have a, a, um, um, a youth success team, a product education team, uh, and we all need to uh, share and collaborate on, okay, this is what we're building, but does the community know about it? And we shared it one time. How can we keep reminding the community about this feature if it's something that we know that we, we heard that they, they wanted, but everybody might not know that we have it or remember that we have it. It's just, it's a constant communication and a constant I won't say struggle, but it is a constant uh, evolving process that I'm, I'm sure all companies can do better, but, you know, we, we continue to work on. Fantastic. And Wayne, what are your uh, measures of success as a community lead? Or what are the goals that you try to achieve with your efforts? Oh, wow. That's another great question and an evolving question. And I feel like if there was a question of the year for a community it is how do you measure success? How do you measure impact? How do you, what's your ROI? What's, what's your ROI of community? Uh, and I've been, this is evolving with me in the company in the past couple of weeks. So um, I have to bear with me on this one. 
Um, I think about marriage success for as a group community. I think about, um, I try not to think about how many people just attend a meetup or how the number of ambassadors increase or the like hard numbers just in terms of a metric of success of community. With community building, you can measure numbers. Like you grew the site community from zero to 300 in a month. You have organized 10 meetups and you have, for example, and out of 10 meetups a year, you have had average of 50 people attending, so 500 people a year, right? Um, and out of 500, you can measure, say, 10 of those people came in bachelors, right? You can do measure success around community around that. I like to think of community, uh, I like to think that's short term, insightful data to have around community building, um, the community. But to me, community is the long term impact, right? Say 500 people may attend your, your, your meetups throughout the, throughout the year, but it may be six months or a year before someone who may attend that, that, that meetup is now a paying customer, right? And yes, you can track that over time. You have your sales team, your CRM in place. You look, oh yeah, that person attended this meetup six months ago, right? Or that person may have learned a new skill and now is creating more notebooks and helping other people in the forum of Slack and they're never going to be an ambassador. That's, now that's impactful because that is like, and, and they're posting the forum in Slack and now that person now has helped educate 20 other people, 30 other people, right? You can point to, to that first interaction that that, that, that person have, uh, that you had with an individual where they attended meet meetup and, but the message success. So, so, I, so in short, the message success for me is, are you creating engagement as helping people learn? Are you creating engagement as helping people collaborate? Are you uh, creating engagement that is helping inspire people? And if you're doing that, your your community is going to grow by default. I totally agree with you that how do you measure success is the question of uh, community building companies this year. Everyone is talking about it. And I constantly have this conversation with companies that I work with. And what I always tell them is that community is a long-term investment. And if you're only looking at short-term ROI, then you're doing it wrong. When your community is made up of data practitioners, developers, analysts, so these are people that are traditionally used to working in silos and maybe not traditionally collaborate with a lot of people, right? How do you build a community with a group of people that are historically used to work in silos? Being an introvert and a nerd myself, I get it when, you know, you just want to go to a coffee shop and just sit by the computer and not interact with anyone and just cold, right? I get it when you just want, it's like, it's like reading a book. It's just you in the book. It's you in the story. When you're trying to, when you're a developer or, or even a designer, you're just trying to like solve the problem. You're just trying to add on to the code and, and see how the code connects to the rest of, the, of, of whatever you're building and trying to solve that problem or just learn what do I need to write to continue on to the story, right? It's like being an author, right? It's, it can be a, a silo, you know, not lonely, but, um, you know, individual thing until you get ready to push the code to GitHub and collaborate as someone, look at your your code and do a review and so forth, but then you get to have some interactions. Um, so so to me, it's, it's being mindful of that, right? And, and what observable is being mindful of that, okay, individuals may want that same experience in a browser. They Well, they not, May they won't. Some are already doing it. Have that same experience in a browser, like just coding in the browser, not in the IDE uh, app. But no matter if you're designing something, you're writing a book, you're building a website, you're creating a data visualization, you're writing code. At some point, you're going to need help, or you're going to do research, right? You're going to have to look something up, and that is that. Those things, what we try to keep in mind with observable uh, is. is we have the form. So, okay, you may get stuck or you need help asking a form, right? We have SAC community. You need help asking the SAC community. We have support. You need help ask support. So when you look at you, you, your, your code and, 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 uh, and collaborate on it, or, or you may have a bug and someone may catch it and they may fork it and submit it to you. Hey, hey, uh, here's a, here's, here's a error, the bug or error in your code. Let me fork this. And so you can, um, I can show you where your error is at and you can add it back to your code. And so keeping that in mind 
with the platform and with other areas of observable that's not on the platform. So individuals can continue to work how they normally work, like heads down, creating data visualization, coding and browser. Right. So basically it comes down to building spaces and experiences to serve the people that are using the platform um, so that they can keep doing what they do best in the way they do best. Yes. And you also have such a wonderfully diverse and creative community. I was looking at different notebooks, right, or spaces that you guys have on the Observable platform, and I found so many that I found interesting. <laughs> and what is really interesting is also that they all have different diverse skill sets, backgrounds, and goals. And uh, leading this type of community is really fitting for you, as you're also a leading voice and catalyst in diversity and inclusion, as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. And you're also, as you mentioned, the co-founder of Change Catalyst and all the tech inclusion programs focused also on building inclusive tech ecosystems. In line with this, what are some advice that you would give to companies and communities both when it comes to building diverse and inclusive ecosystems and communities? Yeah. Um, what is saying historic has been you can't be what you don't see, right? And so when I think about diverse and inclusive ecosystems, you really should have representation. If you want to build a community of diverse developers or a community of, of whatever, it should, representation should be there at some point. It often is the representation is like the face of it. It doesn't have to be. But let's say if you're trying to build a community of Lego builders, right? But the person leading the charge is not a Lego builder. They like Legos, but they're not a straight and not like a hardcore like Lego builder. All right. You may have someone who, um, who's their first passion is, is sports and they want to build a Lego and, but they're, they're leading child Lego. So what should you do if that's the case? You work at a company and, and you want to build a diverse community of Lego builders, but this person, you know, they like sports. Then that individual should go out and collaborate, partner, work with the, a diverse community of Lego builders. Maybe hire some. Maybe give some, you know, uh, maybe establish some partnerships, invite them to speak, um, uh, create an advisory committee who are diverse uh, Lego builders. Then that person who may be in the sports, but they're leading the charge of, of the Lego building community, they are now more experienced. They have now this team they're working with. They, they collaborate, they understand the problems more of the community of Lego builders. And then they go out and can do the work, right? And so I think, you know, I, it may be a cheese example, but from a, a parable standpoint, that's something that people should do. But also they should listen to what the community of Lego builders want and need, right? If, you know, often we see people reach out to underrepresented people or black communities and it's like, oh, well, uh, we care about you, we support you, we're trying to solve your problem, we're trying to build a community, we're trying to have more, more underrepresented talent or black people in tech. Okay, well, have you talked to your black employees? Have you talked to your disabled employee? Uh, uh, I'm not sure if we're supposed to say disabled anymore. Apologies. But have you talked to your, um, your, your, your women employee? You're trying to build more women leaders. Have you talked to your women uh, leaders, uh, uh, women employees at the team? And so it's a lot of listening, a lot of empathy, a lot of collaboration. There's no one thing that you can do to solve all your problems with building diverse and inclusion ecosystem. A lot of people in tech, especially they, they, um, I've seen over the years that they want one solution. They want like, Hey, give me, give me the blueprint. Give me the outline to help make my, my company more inclusive. Right. And so there's, so it's, it's a lot. It's not, it's not a single um, one thing, but it's a lot that starts with empathy, understanding. And, and also how we were talking about communities in the beginning of the podcast around guidelines and, and so forth. There needs to be clear cut guidelines, policies. Start with leadership, HR, and people working on the culture collectively. Clear guidelines of what this company, the company is going to be, what it's going to stand for, what's allowed or what's not allowed for everybody. For sure. And you know, like, there is definitely no blueprint, as you mentioned, to creating a diverse and inclusive environment. But yes, empathy, listening, having very clear guidelines and enforcing those as well is very important. But it's not always easy. And uh, as someone who leads communities, I also sometimes find it very challenging because I deeply care about the people in our community and I care about their experience. I empathize with their problems as well. I empathize with their passions and I care for them. And sometimes it can be very 
draining on my mental health as well. Because, and also you're always constantly focused on building relationship and empathizing and talking with others. You yourself are a founder of the Icon Project. So you've been addressing mental health and professional development needs for black and brown men in tech. And you openly discuss about your own mental health journey on your blog and on social media. And I really wanted to, you know, ask your view on first, what is the correlation of communities, let's say, and mental health? And second, how can people leading communities make sure that they build while also protecting their mental health? Yeah, great question. It's something that's not discussed enough. And the why is because there's this stigma still going into 2023, the stigma still of talking about mental health and as being something that everyone's not okay to do and that people look down on, right? People judge. We look at how people celebrate uh, people who made it, people who, who like look like they have very hyper-successful and they just overcame all challenges, right? Mental health, financially, whatever. They just made it. That's what we celebrate. We don't celebrate the people who, who will say, I'm hurting, I need help, or I want someone to talk to, or I need a break right now because I'm dealing with life, or we don't we don't really celebrate or talk about or make it normal for people who may be dyslexic, hyperset. You know, this is not all mental health, but this is still human human behavior and things we deal with. You know, when you talk about myself, like dyslexic, hyper, hypersensitive, um, uh, deals with anxiety, ADHD. Um, you know, we 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 kind of you know shine away from that a little bit because it could make other people feel uncomfortable. Because it's not a normal conversation. We talk about things like that when it's kids and we give them medicine often, right? Say, hey, take this and go deal with it. You'll be okay. And that's not often the case. So, or, or childhood trauma, for example. We don't talk about trauma, how it affects it, how it shows up. And then in the workplace, we have, you know, especially in tech, we've always put the narrative, we've always share the narrative about people working in the garage, staying up all night. You know, if you love the company, you're going to work hard, you're going to give it all. And celebrate the people who have like made this like fake sacrifice of, or real sacrifice of like giving up everything and, and not taking care of their bodies and mind and just working all day. And, and then they went on to do something amazing and made a lot of money and whatever. But that comes at a cost, right? And so you take those two value, those two kind of cultures, so to speak, of people who are in need of taking care of their mental health and well-being, and people who are people who won't demand of individuals in the workplace or man in the community, for example, they're going to bump heads, and they have been bumping heads, and people have been hurting, and people have died. And because of it, because of the demand of we put individuals to have some sort of perceived success for working all day, all night, or the or what they have other individuals overcome because they didn't have to deal with these things. Or they may just deal with them in a different way. Drugs, alcohol, abuse, taking their trauma, projecting on others, hurting others, creating a cycle of pain. People have dealt with it in, a, in their own way. It may not have been helpful as well. So in community, we have to pause and, and really check in on people and think about humans first versus thinking about just what we're trying to get out of people. And I think that's where the correlation is like, okay, are you checking on the community? How are you doing? Or are you just saying, hey, buy this, share this, sell this to individuals? And as a community builder, that can be very, as a community builder, and maybe as, as an introvert, extrovert, depends on who you are. You are. And even at some point, as an extrovert, you got to take a pause and refill your cup, so to speak. It can be very, very, very difficult as a community builder because community building often, where there's that mass of, hey, meetups, events, social media, collaboration, join this, connect people. Often you are, you connect people or you build relationships, you take it on, you can take on other people's energy or what they go into in that moment. And that is going to impact you in, in, in different ways. Even like you in this podcast, think about all the individuals you interviewed. 
those conversations impact your your behavior, your mindset, you know, what you learn. And uh, you have to take time to, to take care of yourself. But being a community builder and mental health, uh, take care of mental health should be a hand-to-hand dialogue. I really agree with you. And I really think that this is a topic that people should talk about more, especially because nowadays we live in this world where there is an epidemic of loneliness and um, depression. And there are so many people dealing with all these issues. And needless to say, even if we live in a world that is more connected than ever, people are so isolated and so lonely and they're going through so many things. And it's really important, as you said, to build communities with mindfulness in mind with putting the people first and the people experience first, both for the people that we're building the communities for and for ourselves. Because at the end of the day, you can't take care of people if you don't take care of yourselves. So Wayne, how do you create your own community for yourself uh, to help you with your own mental health and career as well? Yeah, um, over the years, I've, I've started various communities you know, for companies or from organizations and and then I say around 2017 is really I really started developing my own community for me. Uh, the first one was the site community for black and brown men in tech. It grew out of being in San Francisco, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. There's not, uh, historically, there's, there has not been a lot of you know black people in tech, black men. And I knew I was the only one that was struggling with mental health um, at the time and wanted, and, and wanted just to collaborate more and see more, right? And create opportunities for others to connect as well. So started a Slack community and that was huge for me in 2017 just to see just to know that I was not alone right you know start you running your own company back then and, and doing work in DNI and, and you know you, it felt like you know you, you, you talk to several companies and you see or you go walk into a, a startup or a company in San Francisco Silicon Valley you may see one black person you're like oh okay hey how you doing that's, I'm saying you're like hey I'm a Slack community what you want and so, so back, that's how I did it back in the day and then Around, I think the same time, a little, a little bit later, when things changed in American politics, I I, I stopped using uh, Twitter and other platforms, and uh, with some of my close friends, and we created a single group, um, and those are like my fam, my family, and is uh, five of us, and and we share everything. We talk about life, talk about world, and, and it's our safe place, right? Safe place we can. Shall we feel it? Have a bad day, and 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 we're not. We're not, it's not judged. There's no judgment, and so that signal group has changed my life, and and uh, and where you know I may vent about work or life or the world, things I can't can't control, and but I just want to outlet. Uh, uh, so do things like like I said in the beginning, connect to your hobbies, connect to your passion, connect to what you love, and correct the learning and skill development. This really inspires me because oftentimes when we talk about communities, we also forget that the communities that are the dearest to us and that we are the most involved in are most most often the communities with our friends, with our family, with the small circles. Community is everywhere nowadays. And I, I feel like I'm seeing that word all the time and companies of all sorts are building them. You, you shared a lot of different advice throughout this podcast, but if you can single out one thing, what advice would you give to companies who are starting to build their own community? Start small and listen. And, and if I dive in more on that, is if you're a company that is building, like I, top of mind, I think about where Twitter's shutting down the news on the platform, right? R- River. And I saw on Twitter that um, a, another company has a similar tool and they're like, hey, Everybody import your newsletter your to our platform. You don't have to wait until join the product. Like right now, it's a closed beta, right? And so I think about that and I'm like, okay, off the bat, if people see that, they're going to have a early adopted community if people import their, their newsletter from Twitter's newsletter to their platform. Off the bat, they're going to have these early adopters and these these group of individuals who are have to change their workflow from how they used to do things to this new platform. That group is it's your early adopter community and it's your transition community, and you may have to like do some different onboarding with them. And then you just learn from what their their pain points were from the other other platform they're coming from and what they would like to have, 
that's that's your advocacy. That, not not your advocacy. That's where you get your feedback from. That's your learning group. Now you can say, oh, I need to be able to this, this, this. And I think about companies just, you know, not just a, not necessarily that particular example, but when you start small and you listen from people pain points from coming from a platform being shut down or you building one feature that you know is solving a core problem for your community or, or certain individuals. When you start listening and say, hey, they want this and you start acting on it fast. Like I know five people wanted this. May not be a hundred, but five people want this feature. Those may be the five who, who spoke up, but maybe a hundred wanted it. And you listen, you start building on it and keep reiterating that process and listen with empathy. Community building is not that hard after that. <laughs> and Leslie, what is a community that you've been a part of that really changed your life? Hmm. I'm going to put a smile on my face. It's the most I could community. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going I'm to go with that. I'm going to say the community that I've been proud of the chain of life is most like a community. Because I've seen a lot of people in the most like community who don't look like the stereotypes do things that I didn't think that was possible for me and it inspired me to do. Ten years ago, you were like, oh, I'm going to do a cross-country motorcycle trip solo. Like, not anything I do that. Or like my wife and I rented mo- we, we went to Spain, we rented motorcycles and rode around Spain and France in the mountains. Beautiful. Didn't think I would ever do that. We took a trip. I sound very bougie right now, but we took a trip to Baja, California for a month of August and and uh, we rode my wife and I rode um, London Apple, we rode motorcycles all the way down from San Francisco to the tip of Baja, California back. And it was amazing, life changing. You know, being out in nature. It, it was just impactful, it made me feel grateful for life, feel grateful for this planet, uh, what we need to do to take care of this planet. It made me feel grateful for what I have at home. Also made me realize I have too much stuff. I need less. I don't need as much stuff as I have. It made me feel grateful for a job. Also made me feel grateful to how I can help others. So those moments out in nature, disconnected from everything happening in the world, really puts things in perspective. So the most I can community help shaped me in a different way that I didn't think it would. Maybe more adventurous, maybe we want to get out more. Wayne, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm super grateful to have this chat with you. And I hope to chat to you soon. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity and good luck well, with your podcast and keep keep always keep on it. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. In the spirit of communities, I would greatly appreciate it if you shared our podcast with one friend who you think will love it as well. If you found this valuable and want to be part of the revolution too, you can subscribe to the show on any of your favorite podcasting apps, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And you can find all the episodes with complete transcripts and show notes at amity.co slash podcast. Let's unlock the power of communities one conversation at a time.